How do you take a good car and make it great? Just like this. Subaru and Toyota engineers kept everything that was good about the car and improved it in all of the areas that needed it most. Today we're going to take a detailed look at the new Subaru BRZ. Let's start with what we can see from the outside. The front of the BRZ is arguably the most controversial part of the car. I see a lot of influence on the front bumper here. There's clearly a little bit of Corvette and even a little bit of Kia Stinger if you look closely. But the closest resemblance that I could find actually doesn't exist in real life. It can be found on the Invitero Coquette, which is a car that exists in the Grand Theft Auto 5 universe. One big thing that I like about the new front bumper is that, unlike its Toyota Super Cousin, every opening on the front bumper is functional. There's no big mustache like on the previous generation to hide the crash beam, and there's no fog light blanks either. The new vents on the front corners of the bumper channel air away from the front wheels, both reducing drag and narrowing the high pressure zone on the front of the car. But I would argue that the new bumper is not without its faults. The first thing that stands out to me is the fact that the rest of the car was very clearly designed by Toyota, and the front bumper is the only part of the exterior that Subaru had a hand in. Therefore it makes it stand out because Subaru was trying to put their own design language onto a car that doesn't match the rest of their lineup. It definitely looks very busy compared to the rest of the car, with every inch of space being occupied by a crease or a vent or some other feature. The front bumper has four separate openings on it, and while they're all functional, it just doesn't seem very necessary. There's also a big mess of shapes that don't really flow very well into each other, making it kind of difficult to look at. But the bigger problem that I have with the front bumper is the fact that they inexplicably chose to integrate the front license plate holder into the painted part of the bumper. They did this by molding a giant rectangle right onto the nose of the car under the badge. It looks awful. Thankfully, according to the spy photographs, it appears that Toyota is taking this into consideration and integrating it into the plastic grill instead of the bumper itself. Let's move to the side of the car and have a look at the car's most striking feature, the new wheel vents on the fenders. It's pretty obvious to see that Toyota engineers used the Lexus RCF as inspiration for the side profile of the car. And like the front bumper, these vents are functional. The vent is integrated into a front fender flare which originates in front of the wheel and leads so far back that the contouring actually makes it onto the leading edge of the door. The bottom edge of the vent flows into a very pronounced and very wide side skirt. And speaking of skirts, that's another difference between this car and the previous generation. This car actually has plastic side skirts. Similar to what you might find on the 350Z or the 370Z, having removable plastic side skirts means that aftermarket developers will have a much easier time building body kits for this car. The wheels are easy to pinpoint because they're literally the same wheels that come on the Yaris GR4. Hopefully that means that they are lightweight because they sure do look good. The brakes and the suspension appear to be carryover or very similar to the previous generation car. However, it appears that the tires that come standard on the car are going to be Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires. That's going to be both a huge upgrade from the previous generation's Primacy tires and also it appears that it doesn't hinder the car from being able to slide around a corner. Let's move to the rear of the car and have a look at those taillights. Like the outgoing generation, they are full LED, but they have a much less awkward shape this time around. They are simpler and more elegant, and they follow the body lines of the car much better than the previous one. The black trim piece running the length of the trunk between the taillights is unique and makes the trunk seem less tall. It also reminds me a little bit of the Acura NSX rear end. The trunk lid itself is very different from the 2020 model. The third taillight has been moved from the back window to the top of the trunk, and there's now an integrated backup camera just above the black trim piece. The license plate is also no longer located on the trunk lid and has instead been moved to the bumper. The exhaust tips appear to be a direct carryover from the current model, and it would appear that some of the higher spec models will get parking sensors as well. And finally, at the bottom of the bumper, we have a much more visually interesting black trim piece. Let's have a look under the hood. For the second generation BRZ and its Toyota equivalent, Subaru has bumped up the displacement to 2.4 liters. Early speculation was that this motor would produce 215 horsepower and roughly 160 foot-pound of torque, gains of about 10 in each measurement. However, the new motor nearly tripled these original claims, 
and reportedly generates 228 horsepower and 185 foot-pounds of torque, significant gains in both categories. However, more important than the increased power is whether or not Subaru was able to solve the biggest complaint of the previous generation car, the torque dip. Dynographs, or any indication of the new motor's power delivery, has not been released to the public yet. However, what does exist is this graph that exists on the BRZ's dashboard. On this graph, you can see a very slight dip in the middle of the rev range that appears to be far less severe than the first generation car. However, it's impossible to know whether or not this is accurate, so we can only speculate for now as to whether or not they have fixed this issue. The engine bay itself looks very familiar, with only minor visual differences from the previous car. A few of these differences include that the intake tube is no longer a right angle, but instead points toward the throttle body at a 45 degree angle, increasing airflow. It's difficult to say without physically standing in front of the car whether or not there's actually more space in front of the motor on the new car, but it sure does seem like that is the case. The PCV valve return line is on top of the intake tube instead of on the side this time around. The new motor is reverting back to a plastic intake manifold instead of the red aluminum one from the outgoing model. The sound tube that pumped intake noise into the cabin is no longer present. And finally, and most importantly, under the oil filter is a new Subaru OEM sandwich plate, which means that the new Subaru BRZ will come from the factory with an oil cooler. Photos and videos do not show where the new oil cooler is located, but the fact that it has one at all is huge news for track going enthusiasts. Moving on to the interior. The designers of the original car pretty much nailed it the first time around, so big changes were not necessary in here. The seats look like they might be the exact same shape as the previous car, just with nicer upholstery and a different pattern. The shifter, heated seat buttons, pedals, and steering wheel are all carryover items as well. The first major difference that you'll notice in the interior is the center stack, where the air conditioning and the radio are located. The dual zone climate control knobs now have the readout on the knob itself instead of over it, and the push button start has been moved out from behind the shift knob to a much more convenient location at the corner of the radio. The radio itself is a much more elegant design and reminds me a lot less of a cheap aftermarket unit, and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come standard now. Sharp eyes will notice that the handles on the door cards are now gone. They've been replaced with simple holes in the armrest padding to use to pull the door shut. It's interesting to me that they got rid of the handles, but that was likely to add additional clearance for the cup holders in the door, which in my experience had difficulty fitting large bottles because of the handles. The shape of the dash on the passenger side is completely different from the first generation car. The textured plastic trim piece that flowed all the way around the radio onto the passenger side is completely gone replaced by a contoured dash that emulates the RCF once again. The circular vents on the edges of the dashboard are pulled straight from the Toyota Corolla, and not even the current model. These are the exact same vents that Toyota put in the previous generation Corolla from 2016 to 2019, and the bezels around the vents are huge, far less subdued and minimalist than the first BRZ. One of my favorite parts about the new interior is the gauge cluster. New for this generation, it is completely digital, and what is displayed on it is dependent on what mode the car is in. Drivers have their choice of a traditional round tachometer or a linear style one. The left side of the gauge cluster can be customized as well, to display an oil temp gauge, a G-meter, or the dynograph that I mentioned earlier. But the best part about the new dash is the startup sequence, which emulates a boxer motor. The silver gauge surrounds even emulate a pair of pistons in a flat configuration. Very clever! So now the question is whether or not this new car is worth purchasing. The short answer is yes. If Subaru has addressed the shortcomings of the previous generation, then this could be one of the best value cars in its class. Now, is it worth trading up to the new car from the old one? That depends. If you've kept your current BRZ stock up until this point, then yes. If you want a better performing version of the car that you already like, then by all means, it's time to trade up. However, if you're like me and you've spent years customizing and modifying your car to your taste and the way that you want it to behave, it's likely not worth trading all of that just to start over at square one. With that said, I personally do intend to purchase the new car, likely the Toyota version. And my reasoning is this. Sales of both cars in the United States peaked at 2013 at over 26,000 cars sold, 
and that number has dwindled down to a combined figure of less than 6,000 cars sold in 2019. As of September, only 3,700 cars have been sold in the United States in 2020. As interest in electric cars grows, with some countries even going so far as to straight up ban the sale of gasoline powered cars by 2035, this may be one of the last opportunities to get a brand new, lightweight, manual transmission sports car. And that's not an opportunity that I want to let pass. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it and you want to see more of the things that I've made, I have two suggestions here on the right for you. Or if you want to support me for free, hit the subscribe button there on the left. It would mean a lot to me. Have an awesome day.